Are we ready? I'm ready if you are. Okay. Uh, can you describe an early experience you had in a public library? Yeah, my earliest memories, my I was in elementary school and growing up in Simpsonville, South Carolina, we had a really small public library branch there and my mom would take my brother and I to get books uh, every week and I was just picking up, you know, like this was in the 80s, so like Beverly Cleary books and things like that, series books, but there was this really fascinating librarian there, um, older lady, white hair, super smart. You could just tell she was like super smart. As soon as you walk in, she starts talking to you, but she was always really kind and I think she was a general librarian, but she was very good with me and my brother too. And I remember her name was, um, I still remember her name because of how she told us her name was I'm a Jean because she said she always told people she, I'm a genius. No. <laughs> so I'm a Jean, wherever you are, if you're still around. It sounds like it made a big difference. Will. What are you currently reading? So I, a little while ago, I read a book. It was called The Remarkable Rescue of Milkweed Meadow by Elaine Dimopoulos. And there's a sequel to that. It's called The Perilous Performance in Milkweed Meadow, same author, of course. And I love the first one so much. We were on, actually on a panel discussion together um, where we were talking about our books. Um, but it's such a kind of an old, like a classic vibe to it. It's about animals, you know, uh, you know, uh, that are in someone's backyard and they mostly rabbits and they live this sort of interesting life. And uh, there's a lot of adventure and peril and things like that in it. And it's a, it has like a cozy classic vibe to it and beautifully illustrated um, by Doug Salati, who was the Caldecott medalist last year. And so um, I'm looking forward, I'm read, starting to read uh, the second one now, um, Perilous Performance at Milkweed Meadow. <laughs> what was one of the worst jobs you had before becoming a full-time artist? Worst jobs. Um, I was a janitor, you know, like at a, it was a summer job. And um, I would say it was, it was just, it was an interesting experience. I, I didn't really have to get my hands that dirty, but it was kind of interesting in a way where people don't really notice you when you're a janitor. They don't like look at you. It's sort of like a weird, it made me it made me appreciate these sort of jobs that um, are kind of happening in the background that that uh, people might look down their noses at. And uh, I was a kid, you know, so it wasn't really something I thought about too much. But um, I think it really taught me a lot about how to respect people that are working around you and you might not even notice it and be kind to them and just acknowledge that they are alive. But uh, it was to say it was the worst makes it sound terrible, but it, it, it was it was challenging to to be working around people all the time and not be not be acknowledged. Yeah. You wrote and illustrated a book about Mr. Rogers. Can you re recall an episode of his that really sticks with you now that you're an adult? Uh, I think it's really just his overall um, message and his overall presentation about being kind, being empathetic to others, learning about others, not just sort of living in your own existence, but knowing that the world is a big, complicated place, that um, there's so much to learn, being curious, not, not ever wanting to stop being curious and to learn about others, because when we do, I think that's when we shut ourselves off to so many things that are happening in the world, and we think that we, uh, and know know so much about the world and know things without even actually encountering it. So uh, I just loved how how kind and curious he was um, through his whole life, and he spoke that way towards children. But I think he was a great role model in that way to the parents that were also watching. Tell us about the space where you sit and write and draw. I used to work 
from my house, like the basement of our house for years. And I, I liked having the kind of simplicity of being able to just walk downstairs and go to work every day. But uh, during the lockdowns of COVID, um, my wife, we were all at home and my wife, Julie, was like, you need to get out of the house. <laughs> so uh, so I, I looked for a small studio space nearby. It's just, it's in a, at first I was looking for this, this like beautiful idyllic place with a, a scene of like out the window of like a pasture or the woods. And I realized that I wasn't going to be able to find that. So now I work in like, I'm surrounded by like dentists and lawyers and it's like a, an office building complex. But it's a, it's, a, it's a single room studio. I just go there every day, close myself off to all the distractions. Um, I have lots of pictures on the wall that inspire me, lots of books on the shelves that inspire me, two desks that I work at and go back and forth every day. And it's just a great little oasis from, uh, it's actually, it, I, I, I like it a lot. I'm glad that my wife kicked me out because I've really enjoyed having a, a studio space at least the last couple years. If you were an owl, which species would you be and why? Oh, I think, um, so I have a huge obsession with owls and uh, I love looking for them because they're impossible to find. Um, there's a little owl, it's called a sawwet, northern sawwet owl, and um, it's probably one of the hardest to find. Um, they're really small and they only come in, in my area in the winter time. Um, but they, they're very cute, not that I'm cute, but they're very <laughs> cute owls, but they're just, they're so, uh, they're so difficult to see and to look for. And, uh, but at the same time, when you find them, they're, they're not very afraid. Um, you could walk right up to them and, and they're not going to like flush out of the tree. I think they don't really understand because they're mostly, uh, northern owls, they're not as uh, understanding of threats as they come south for the winter. So, but uh, that was a very nerdy answer to that question. But I, I just love that, that it's so hard to find and it's sort of like such a treasure to find when you can find one. Who's an artist that you find inspiration from? Um, oh man, I have so many. Uh, let me think about one that I could say. Uh, I think uh, one of my one of my all time favorite illustrators is is a British artist. His name's Quentin Blake. He's illustrated a lot of uh, classic Roald Dahl books, like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and. Um, James and the Giant Peach, but he's had a very long legacy himself, a very long career as an illustrator in the UK, Quentin Blake, and he's actually been knighted Sir Quentin Blake, and he's, it's a different existence from what we have here, I think. He's, he's done so many different, he's had his hand in so many different things that he's very much a celebrity in England. Like, we don't really have, I don't think, too many celebrity children's book illustrators here, but they're appreciated in a different level um, in other countries. And uh, I just love his, his artwork. It's very loose and free and uh, experimental at times. He's pen and ink and watercolor, and it's, every book is such a it's, a... it's a consistent style normally, but it's just so refreshing to see it. Any time I see a new drawing by Quentin Blake, I'm just so floored by the work that he does. Sir Quentin Blake. <laughs> As a birder, what are some birds that you haven't seen that you'd really like to see? So birding, I'm pretty, I'm somewhat new to birding. I mean, I, I've only been doing it for maybe like five years. Like as some people that do it their whole lives, but um, I, I, my favorite birds are birds of prey. I, I like eagles, hawks, owls, uh, raptors. Um, 
they're just very charismatic birds, very, a lot of times very large birds, they're hunters, you know, they're just really, anytime I see a, a bird of prey circling in the sky, I have to stop, I mean, at least take a peek, you know. And so, but owls have really captured my imagination, and so there's so many species of owls that I haven't seen yet. There's one, the one that I really want to see is one that I don't see in our area. I have to travel to see it. It's called a great gray owl. It's a really, it's one of the largest species of owls here in the U.S. And um, it's very big in appearance, but it's actually almost all feathers. So it's very, if you pushed your hands against it, the, the actual bird, your fingers would sink into the feathers. But they're really big and just uh, impressive in size. So someday, I want to drive up to like northern Minnesota or wherever you have to go to see some great gray owls. What is it about zines and zine culture that gets you really fired up? Um, you know, zines were things that I, I grew up sort of in the punk rock community and zines and also grew up in the, you know, 80s and 90s and zines are they're still around, but they were really much bigger back in the day when the internet wasn't a thing and, and it was just a way for people to make things, you know, like tell your own stories or talk about the things that you love to do or draw comics. And you could just print them yourself on a, go to the copy shop and print them on the copy machine, staple them together and you've made something. You've made a book basically. And uh, it's such a neat little peek into someone's life. They're usually funny or um, very uh, heartfelt at times and, you know, kind of journal-esque. And so I, that was a big part of my 20s, and that's actually how I met my wife, Julie, because she was a, a zinester as well, and I, I knew her zine before I knew her. What's a nostalgic food item from your childhood? Nostalgic food item. Um, so the food, I grew up here in the South and the food has a very distinct uh, sort of legacy to it, you know, and uh, the Southern cooking, you know, like <laughs> the meat and three vegetable type thing. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's really just about, like there was this one thing that we always had um, at any big, big family holiday or whatever and my dad called them greasy green beans and uh <laughs> it's like green beans that are cooked into submission essentially um with pork in them and like so much oil and stuff that, that they're not even there's like not any substance almost it's almost like soft tissue <laughs> by the time they're done and my dad always described them as greasy green beans and he's like said that he didn't even, he, he, he knew it was right if they just kind of melted in your mouth, like you, you didn't have to do much chewing. <laughs> so yeah, the, I, I don't know if I could still eat that, but I still think about the greasy green beans from time to time and the taste. If you weren't an illustrator, what do you think you'd be doing? Probably a scientist of some sort. Um, I just there's so many sciences that really are just about studying the the outside world uh, you know i mean i think i would probably be a biologist like an animal biologist just because i there's something really fascinating about all these things happening um i feel like as humans we live in our own existence most of the time and we kind of forget that there's all these worlds happening all around us at all times and you can quickly you can quickly remember that if you just go for a walk at a forest preserve or a, on a trail somewhere that animals are like living this like life or death existence <laughs> every day just, just to survive. And I find all that very fascinating that there's all these circles of life happening all the time um, that are very dire and, and difficult and, and it's just so I would love to be able to study that like on a daily basis. I don't know what, 
animal in particular, but anytime I look at anything, you know, I've learned about wolves and birds and things like that. I just dig really deep because I just, it's such a, a like a bottomless uh, place to, to study and try to understand and something in the animal world would be a lot of fun, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna go switch to this or that. Early morning or late at night? Late at night, 100%. I've never been a morning person. Outside or inside? Outside, I'm mostly inspired and get better ideas when I go outside. Deep dish or thin crust? Thin crust. Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi? Empire, definitely. It's, there's more tension and better story, I think. Space Oddity or Ziggy Stardust? Uh, Ziggy, that was a really crucial Bowie period. Mustard base, pepper vinegar, or ketchup base? <laughs> I love the mustard base sauce. <clears throat> Mountains or the beach? Mountains. Cybermen or Daleks? <laughs> uh, Daleks, they're so weird. That's it. Okay, cool. <laughs>